Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I am your host, JP John Paz. And of course, joining me today is the man behind the death of WCW book and the man behind WrestleCrap, Mr. R.D. Reynolds. R.D., how are you doing today, sir? I'm amazingly blessed. Thanks for having me on. Hey, no problem at all. Always wanted to get you on and kind of just shoot the shit and talk about, you know, many different things. But first and foremost, what have you been up to? Uh, let's see. I've been working on the website. This will be 21 years Whoa. of WrestleCrap.com. Yes, sir. Jesus. Wow. April 1st. April 1st is 21 years. So the site now is uh, legally allowed to go drink. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it needs a few drinks after all the stuff we've covered over the years. Is that purposely done April 1st? Yes. Actually, okay. uh, yeah, absolutely. I... I just thought that would be a good date. <clears throat> Excuse me, April Fools and everything, and um, it's really weird because that uh, that date is kind of spilled over into other parts of my life. Uh, like I helped to open a business in the Netherlands, and I said, "Okay, we can do it, but it's got to be on April 1st. <laughs> and they're like, "Why?" And I was just like, "Trust me, it worked out well for other things." Yes, insane. Where'd you get the idea? Like when you first started out, 21 years ago. Like where did you kind of get the idea? I had paid too much for a computer and I felt I needed to justify having spent three thousand nineteen ninety nine or two thousand you know uh you know nineteen ninety nine dollars wow I mean that's like fifteen thousand dollars now or something yeah uh, on a computer and I was like I really gotta justify this I should probably try and figure out you know how to do like a website or something and so I kept bouncing around ideas um, and my main uh, hobbies and passions were uh, video games uh, and wrestling. And I was like, okay, well, there's lots of, uh, even back then, there were lots of wrestling sites. There were lots of video game sites. I, I, at the time, I didn't have sources or anything. I didn't know Dave Meltzer or, or Brian or anybody. And I was like, I just want to do, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I, but I got to do something. Uh, and I was talking to my buddy one night. And this was the height of the Monday Night Wars. Uh, and he said, man, did you see this thing on Nitro? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, that was pretty bad. And he goes, well, that's the worst thing I ever saw. And I was like, you never saw the gobbledygooker. And then he counted with, well, what about the Black Scorpion? And we just went back and forth for about an hour. And I said, boom, uh, got the idea. Uh, and I was trying to come up with what I could call it. You know, the you know, worst of wrestling, wrestling hall of shame. Uh, something like that. I remember just looking at my wife. I go, what do you think about WrestleCrap.com? And she just looked at me and rolled her eyes. And I was like, that's the reaction I wanted. Nice. So that's where the idea came up, came from. So, yeah. Such a great idea. Like, if you just go back and think about it. I know there's been a lot of kind of copycats over the years. I don't know if you've quite noticed that, but there's been a bunch. But I know it just, especially at that time period when you guys came out, that's like, wow, this is an awesome idea. Because me and my friends, we would always have this tape called like a screw-up tape. So, yep. you know, you you develop a tape and have all the screw-ups. And, and one of us would edit, you know, add stuff to it. And the other one, and, and you watch. So you guys had it down to a science. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because we were one of the first people that would go in and it, this drove my wife nuts too, is I would just say, okay, we got to drive around to all the video stores and see what tapes we could find. Because, you know, we were doing tape trading too. Yeah. But I mean, it was something that not a lot of people understood. Okay, if you hook up a VCR to a computer, you can grab video off of that. You, I mean, you couldn't really grab video because it was so archaic back then. I mean, YouTube was years away, uh, but I mean, I had to run around to video stores or do tape trading to try and find, you know, just raw footage uh, of this stuff. And so, uh, yeah, that was a that was a weekend uh, for the Reynolds for poor Mrs. Deal is uh, me driving around going, you know, I don't think we've checked that that blockbuster. They opened a new Hollywood video. We should go check that. And, you know, just trying to find wrestling tapes uh, just to record the stuff you know and get uh audio and what have you because you know audio back then that was that was real new too you know dating myself but again it's been 21 years so uh it was just a lot of you know going back and and just uh running the tech as as best we could uh to grab you know and make animated gifs you know three frame animated gifs was whoo look at that 
Yep. That guy fell through a wall. You know, that was, you know, something, you know. I remember we used to go around to the video stores too and try to get the tapes, especially if they would actually sell the tapes and not just rent right. them. Hey, we, will you sell it? So oh, I yeah. remember this one lady was like, uh, we sold the tape to somebody and now I'm starting to think that these tapes are worth more than I'm selling them for. So they're like, oh no, damn, I mean, somebody <laughs> got there before us and bought a bunch. Yes, yeah, so they're like, damn. Uh, so I remember I got WrestleFest 94, but yep. like for a decent price, she was trying to charge me like 20 bucks. Well, yeah, I have a 10, you know, trying to go back and forth. But I, that is such a thing, you know, like, I, over, like around that generation for fans like us. It's like, we got to get those tapes. Yeah, I had I had a great uh, guy. He's still a friend of mine named uh, Wild B. Brown. Wild Bill Brown. Oh, I remember him. Yeah. Oh, tapes, yeah. Man. At conventions. Yep. He was he was the man and he really helped me out. Uh, finding a lot of this stuff because I'd be like, man, I can, I just cannot find footage of you know Max Moon or Fantasio or the, all these gimmicks that were only around for a very, very brief time. I mean, Fantasio, I think, had like one, one televised match, and so just trying to get that stuff. Now, you know, it, that's the thing is, is you know, life changes, technology changes. Now you can just you know Google. You know, there was, you know, Metacrawler or whatever back then, uh, you know, and, and it was also crude um, and, and you couldn't find that stuff. Uh, and now, you know, you Google Fantasio, boom, there's the YouTube link and you can watch it. And, yeah. and you know, that's I mean, it's it's awesome. Don't get me wrong. I love having you access to YouTube, Daily Motion, you know, uh, WWE Network, however long that's going to be around. And, uh, you know, I love that stuff, but it, it was just a different world back then. So we, we kind of had technology on our side. It's funny you mentioned the, the copycats because, you know, a lot of people consider like, um, you know, wrestling with regret or botchamania or something like that, uh, you know, copycats. And I, I just consider them like good friends now who do it better than I ever did. So <laughs> I, I'm, I was thrilled to meet uh, both of those guys and, and become friends with them because, you know, they, they have done something that, that I didn't do. They, they've made it into a, a video medium. Uh, and then who knows, you know, what, what it's going to wind up being, uh, you know, for the people that, the uh, you know, uh, go after them. Uh, cause it, it will always, I mean, it's, it's a comedy. It's, you know, seeing ridiculous wrestling, uh, you know, a guy hatching out of an egg. There, there's always going to be, uh, wrestle crap. There's always going to be that worst of wrestling, you know, the, the wrestling with the rep, botch of mania. You're always going to have that as long as there's pro wrestling around. And, you know, of course, we all hope that'll be for uh, decades and, and, and millennia to come. Man, uh, I think, was it last week or the week before Randy Orton was spitting out the black goo or whatever? Right. I mean, I mean Shango, baby. Yep. Ultimate Warrior style, so it's like, man, it just never ends with the you know the stupid stuff. I think What's recently on new again, <laughs> yes, and I think you just put on your site that horrible karaoke segment that, oh, that yeah. got an induction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was that was just you know again. I mean, it's it's stuff that is uh, you know there's always something horrible, and, and that's what I've always said about wrestling. I always want it to either be. Really, really good. I would prefer it, honestly, to be really, really good, even though I don't have material then. I, I love really, really good wrestling. I love really, really terrible wrestling, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst is when it's just in the middle and it's just boring. That's that. Mm. A lot of Raws are like that these days. You know, you're like, oh, man, can I slog through this three hours? And, you know, it's tough. It's been like that for a while on Raw, but that's yeah. why I like when they put that Randy Orton stuff in there because, like, okay, well, here we go now. Now I can laugh or get in, get into this, you know. Yeah, um, this is something different. Yeah, I know they've had some bright spots, but I mean, you you kind of root for a little bit of the, the bad spots uh, a bit. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm always hoping for. I don't want it to just overflow <laughs> like it kind of seemed to do last year with you know retribution and and all the fiend stuff. But yeah, I mean, I. I love seeing the, I love seeing the ridiculous stuff. That's a lot of people always point to you know um, you know WCW like ninety nine two thousand like oh my gosh that was like the worst stuff ever. It's like it it was. It, don't get me wrong, but it was also something that it was you you it was it was that car wreck you really couldn't take your eyes off of. At mm -hmm. least I, I guess everybody else did because their numbers just went like that. Right. But I mean, I always enjoyed it because I would always sit there and go, okay, I, you know, this is, uh, 
you know, this is a train wreck happening before my eyes. Uh, and I kind of wanted to see just how disastrous it would be, uh, you know, and it's, it's funny because like, you know, years later I got to talk to, to Vince Russo. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people always think, oh man, you know, Artie and, and Russo are going to like go at each other's throats. But it's something where we both realize we just see wrestling two completely different ways. Um, and that doesn't make either of us terrible or evil or trying to ruin the world. Uh, it's just, we see things completely differently. And so we, you know, a lot of times we just have a good laugh, <laughs> a good laugh at, at what a, what a disaster it all was. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. Cause not that it was like uh, unfriendly the first time around, but when did you mm -hmm. first talk with Russo, was it like a little awkward? It's like, uh, you know, I kind of wrote this book and I kind of ripped you a little bit or, you know, I kind of stuck it to you a bit. Was it awkward the first time you guys talked? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, and it was funny because um, he, I was on his podcast, uh, I don't know, earlier this year, I think. And he had told me, he goes, I had you on my show and I just hated you. I hated you so much because I would just be ranting and raving and you would just be smiling and laughing at me mm. because I won't, I won't get, I won't get, uh, hooked in. I won't, I won't be, be drawn into a fight like that because again, I just see it as different people doing different things. It's the same thing. Whenever I, uh, did that thing with, with Bischoff. You know, I mean, everybody was like, oh, my gosh, you know, you you really should have gone at him. And I was like, in and accomplish what exactly? Because he's going to have his view. I almost view it as like, and this is probably a terrible thing to say. When I was in college, the, the death penalty was something that was always debated. Oh, should we have the death penalty? Or should we not have the death penalty? And I view, you know, especially the death of WCW a lot that way two it's like the death penalty i the, it, just follow me for a second mm -hmm. in that eric bischoff or vince russo or rd reynolds or brian alvarez or whoever none of us are going to say something to the other one that's going to get them to go you know what i never thought of that <laughs> you know and it's the same thing with like the death penalty no one's gonna if you're whichever way you go okay no one's going to come to you and, and say something to you you have not thought of before that's going to change your mind and it's going to flip the switch. It's just not going to happen. And it's the same thing with, with uh, uh, people involved in wrestling and everybody's got to defend themselves. And, and uh, also, I mean, everybody's experience is different. You know, I, I can only imagine the, the, the stress Russo was under or Bischoff was under or whatever. And, you know, it doesn't. <clears throat> it doesn't really uh, give them a free pass on decisions they made. Uh, certainly, because I mean, it wound up, you know, crippling the wrestling business for decades. But um, you know, it was it was something that was. Uh, it's always interesting talking to the different people because you'll get just different reactions. Uh, and now, you know, Russo and I. I mean, we, I don't know. We talk to each other. I don't know once once every month or two, uh, and it's never about. It's never about wrestling. It's, oh, my gosh, did you see this Batman 66 collectible figure, you know, or whatever that he may have found? Uh, we just talk about stuff like that, and it's just like two friends talking now, and that's actually kind of cool. That is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see where it started off, you know, and, and then oh, yeah. kind of where it ended up. When you initially were writing about him and stuff, was there any, like, vitriol there? Like, oh, like, were you mad at it, or was it just kind of just – getting the information and being like, oh, that stinks, that stinks. Or were you really like kind of mad about it at all? Like, oh, I wish you wouldn't have done that. <clears throat> you know, it was funny whenever we started uh, Death of WCW, Brian Alvarez and I, Brian Alvarez, figure4weekly.com, f4wonline.com. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yo, make sure you send me that check, Brian. Did you do <laughs> that? Um, when we started writing that, I'll never forget it because I, I was just thinking of those horrible nitros. Those those ninety nine and two thousand nitros where nothing made sense and it was it was a disaster and and people would vanish and the title would change hands thirty seven times in a month and you know I was like oh man because I just want to make people laugh that's what Russell Crap was designed from day one is I just want to make people laugh I, it was never really anything I want people to have deep thoughts about this you know I just want to make people laugh so I was just thinking I can't wait this is going to be really really fun. Uh, to write this book 
And Brian said to me, um, you were going to get really depressed writing this book. I was like, no, no, we're not. Don't you remember the graveyard match and that junkyard match where everybody got injured and, and you know, all this, the David Arquette winning the world title? How on earth am I going to get depressed writing about this? So I started going back and I was watching Nitro uh, basically from the beginning and really starting to go into that. And I'm like seeing all these great, you know, luchador matches, all these great cruiserweight matches, all this different uh, types of wrestling and, and all this excitement. And I was like, oh my gosh, this show is so awesome. I'd forgotten how awesome it was. And then I was like, and now I got to write about how it's gone in five years. And yeah, I got a little depressed. <laughs> I could see that. Yep. I could yeah. see that. Yeah. So I don't know that I ever got like really, I, I don't know that I ever got angry um, at Russo or Bischoff or, or, or Kevin Nash or any of the rest of them. Maybe a little bit just because they had something, they, they had something so wonderful and it was squandered. Um, I don't know. I, I, it, 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 these days for sure, I don't have anything against them. You know, I, it's, if I did at the time, uh, I can say it's not the case now because you know, it's, it, you, you don't, everyone's situation is different. And I, I think the thing is they just didn't know what they had. And I think if they did, uh, they may have protected a little better. As far as Bischoff and that debate, I know that it was part of, I guess it was part of StarCast, right? If, if I yep. remember correctly, yep. he was, he like, I know he was kind of like getting like maybe a little loud, I guess you, you could say, or how was he getting towards you? And like, what's the relationship there? Was he just angry the whole time? <laughs> he was, we went, we, it, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Cause you, you, you have the, the death of WCW book. You, you held it up before we went on the air. Oh yeah. Right, right here. Yeah. And you can see that picture of picture of him is it's the it is and it was i picked out that picture it's the <laughs> worst picture ever i mean it was just the, the it was and i told him i said that was dirty pool old man is is gomez adams once said it was it was really wrong of me to take that picture and put it on the front of the book but i had to because it was such an awful picture and so we opened it up and before we even went on stage i'll never forget it Bischoff pulls aside, pulls me aside. And I had met him the night before because we were there and we were there. We were doing a wrestle crap thing too. Uh, and okay. I got to tell that part of the story first. We were doing a wrestle crap panel. Uh, and we did that the day before, as I recall. And so we had, uh, we had Katie Vick in a casket because we own the Katie Vick outfit. We bought it years ago from WWE <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, the Oz robe from when Kevin Nash played uh, the great and powerful Oz in WCW. Yep. We had the original, or we had the 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 actual gobbledygooker outfit. Oh, and wow. so we're like running around StarCast, just making noise and just being buffoons and everything else because we're just having the time of our lives. Um. So after the after the WrestleCraft panel, they said, you know, you guys have a, a meet and greet you know, for you to, to meet people, people have paid to, to get autographs, get pictures and all that. So great. That's really cool. I can't believe anybody would ever want a picture with me, but you know, it's fine. Cool. <clears throat> so they wheel us in this room. And again, we're pushing the, the, the Katie Vick casket and everything and just making a mockery out of everything, just hooting and hollering. And we go into this room and over in the corner, Eric Bischoff, who i had never met, he had passed me like several times, but we had never, ever met. He was over in the corner and he's just watching us. He's like, what on, what on earth is this? You could just see it on his face. What, who are these guys? Why do they have a casket? What, they've got the gobbledygooker outfit. What on earth is this? So I went over to him and I just said, Eric. And he says, yes. And I said, I'm R.D. Reynolds. You know, and I put my hand out for him to shake it. And he looked at me and he looked over at Katie Vick. And the guy in the gobbledygooker outfit, and he just buries his hand in his hands. He goes, oh, my God. <laughs> like, it was like the worst yeah. thing ever. And um, so that was that was actually how we met. We met the day before. Um, 
so he kind of he kind of had some vague idea of what I was. Uh, and uh, before we went on stage, he goes, "Just so you know, I do not do comedy. I won't do comedy, but I play the part of an a hole really well." And I said, "Okay." And I said, "Well, I I do comedy." You know, and I and I didn't say this to him, but it was in the back of my mind the whole time I was going to do this thing. I was like, this thing is going to be a clown show. And if it's going to be a clown show, I'm going to wear giant shoes and a bright red nose. I want to make this thing as much of a clown show as I possibly can. So <clears throat> the reason I brought up the book and that terrible picture is I went on stage and I was wearing a jacket. And I said, you know, you know, Eric, you know, you know, I, I, I think Kevin, Sol Kevin Sullivan was there and David Penzer. And I said really nice things about both of them. And I made some comment about how, you know, Bischoff, you're great too. I loved you as the old man preacher in that SmackDown, that Billy and Chuck wedding. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, I know why you don't like me. I said, it's a picture that I put on the front of the, the book and I unzipped my jacket and I actually had a blown up that picture on my shirt <laughs> i said eric we can make a lot of money you know i you know i have i have this photo we can make shirts and i said and i went and got some uh, like these stick heads you know with it was yep. like it cut out of his head and um i said uh I yelled out to my buddy i uh, had in the audience i said uh i said uh you know i i got this one uh, but in order to get one, I had to buy like a bunch of them and, you know, I, so I'm not even going to sell them. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do that. I said, but yelled at my buddy, Hey, how many of these we got? And he goes about 500 of them. I said, hand them out to everyone in the crowd. So we just handed out these ridiculous, yep. you know, heads of Eric Bischoff and <clears throat> it was, you know, it was, I, he did not find humor in it, but I think it was something that caught him a little bit off guard that somebody would come at it like from such a weird angle. Um, so, you know, he, uh, he, you know, railed into me and I wouldn't really take the, 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 yeah, again, I'm not going to get into a big Duke -a -roo with anybody. And I even said, cause it was, that was the weekend of that star cast, that debate. That was, uh, what was the first, it wasn't in AEW at the time. It was all, all in. in, all yep. in. Yeah. And I said, and I had said this to, uh, Matt Jackson, uh, who I saw the, you know, just hanging out in the hotel lobby and I, he came, you know, I went up and said, Hey, you know, aren't you Matt Jackson? And, uh, you know, I said, yeah, I'm the wrestle cop guy. And we had a nice little chat. I said, yeah, it's really cool, Matt, what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to reinvent the business. And I thought about that and that's what Bischoff did too. And we even said that in the book, you know, he really reinvented a business that it was in dire need of being reinvented. Uh, and I said, that's really cool. I said, that's what, you know, the, these guys are, are trying to do these, it wasn't AEW at the time, but these, uh, guys, you know, the box and, and, and Cody and everybody else, they're, they're all trying to reinvent the business. And I said, Eric, that's what you did. I said, we said nice things about you in the book. Maybe you should read the book sometime. And then he told me, you know, afterwards that he had never actually read the book and he was never going to. And we, we laughed about it and actually, you know, took pictures of him like flipping me off. And then there's a, a picture where we were walking like it, essentially into the sunset. Together. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. was completely absurd. But yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I have nothing against Bischoff. I mean, it, all these guys, the Bischoffs, the Cornets and everybody else, they're, I, there's, there's no, I, I would hope people understand these people are all still playing characters. That's what they do. And there may be some, some of what they actually feel in there, but these guys on their podcasts and everything, they're, they're playing characters, you know, especially, you know, Cornette. I mean, anybody that doesn't see, that's just a, you know, a character Bischoff too. I mean, whenever he goes ranting and raving, I mean, anybody that doesn't see that, I, I, don't know what to tell you. I mean, they're they're playing a character just like Roman Reigns or anybody else is. So if he never read the book, how come he's so anti the book? Just because of the name of it and the picture on the cover? Uh, that is a great question. I think because people had told him things that were in the book. Um, and, you know, Conrad, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, and I, I was 
you know, it, I, I was listening, you know, leading up to that, I was listening to a lot of the, the 83 weeks and, and mm-hmm. Eric, I mean, Eric's a great character. I mean, oh, he's yeah. fantastic. I think I still think that, you know, outside of Vince McMahon, he is just a incredible heel authority figure. I think he's, he's just dynamite. I think he's just fantastic. Um, but you know, I think that, uh, sometimes that he gets a little, he gets a little lost in that. Uh, and so he just, he just kind of plays it up and it was funny cause he didn't even know who had read the book. I mean, in the past he has said, you know, Alex Mars Vez and Dave Meltzer. And, you know, it, we actually talked about that, you know, I said, cause he had mentioned it on, on stage. He was like, well, you know, this is what you and Meltzer would write. And I was like, why, why on earth would you mention, you know, me and Meltzer? He goes, well, you know, Dave wrote that book. I was like, no, Dave didn't write that book. And it was me and Brian Alvarez. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, so I think it's just something if, let's say that I, I had a company and it went out of business and there was this, you know, pretty well received book that, you know, said all these terrible, you know, supposedly terrible things about me, you know, people had told me, oh, you know what that guy said about you in this book, you know, and I didn't read it. I, I don't know that I would want to read it either. Um, you know, it's human, it's, it's self-defense, right? Would mm-hmm. you really want to read a book about things that you, you know, a company that you brought to the greatest of heights, the biggest wrestling company in the world up until that time. And then it, it, crashed and burned. I don't know that I would want to read that either. So I, I don't even really blame him. You know, I, I, I know Russo hasn't read it either. That's fine. Um, you know, I totally understand why. Uh, <clears throat> but like I said, and I said this on stage, I said it to him behind the scenes. So, you know, we said nice things about you. So, you know, uh, at some point it may be worth your time to at least get to the parts of the book where we, we did say nice things about you. So. As far as like that book, Bischoff always promotes Nitro, the book by Guy Evans. Great book. Yeah. Oh, I love the book. I, I mean, I like both books. I've read them both. But it's interesting. He, he was saying that Nitro is more, um, I don't know the correct word, accurate, I guess I'll just say. And I actually interviewed Brian Alvarez last year, and I asked him, he said there's no difference between the books. So <laughs> Actually, if you talk Guy, because yep. Guy who, and guy, who, yep. who, who yeah, wrote Nitro. Yep. Yeah, you because know, I've talked, I've talked with him too, and I said, um, I said, well, you know, to me, when Nitro came out, everybody's like, oh boy, you guys are gonna, it's gonna just show you everything that you wrote that was all lies, and you actually see like reviews about that. You know, Nitro is is not lies like uh, Death at WCW was, but if you read it, it was like I was so happy when Nitro came out because if you read Nitro, and and one of the one of the things that we're slagged, we were slagged on is okay well you didn't talk to you know the, the certain people okay right and i was like yes uh some of those people, i mean we tried to get a hold of them and no one wanted to talk to us it's okay uh but whenever you read their accounts it basically confirmed everything we said in death of wcw the books are different because um guys is more um I, I guess analytical would be the thing uh, to use, uh, and ours is way more opinionated. I mean, we we are not afraid to say anything. The other thing is, again, you got to keep in mind the guy, one of the co-authors of that. He's the wrestle crap guy. He wants to write funny stuff. He wants to you know talk comedy, and so guy's book is a little drier. Mm-hmm. Ours is a little more, I think, is is funnier, and that was designed that way. But they both tell the same stories, and both basically confirm what the other one has said. So, I even talked to Guy about that, and <clears throat> I was like, "What did you find? You know, that was different. Um, you know, did you find anything in Death of WCW that that completely contradicted? You know what you found writing Nitro, and he said, "No, not really. There were a few little things here and there, but it was nothing major." But no, I cannot say I cannot say enough good things about Nitro. I thought that was a great book. Thought it was fantastic, it, and, and again, it was nice because it just confirmed what we were saying all along. 
It's interesting, too, that maybe your book, when I mean, you did it in 2005, maybe it was too close to get some of those interviews. Maybe those guys didn't want to talk about it at that point. Oh, you know, he does it you know, almost 20 years later, so maybe right. more people want to talk about it. It was also something that at that time, uh, especially because you and, – and this was the case with the WrestleCrop book, too. Any of those books, especially WrestleCrop.com. I mean, whenever that first started, I was trying to get interviews with people and I mean, imagine, you know, some guy calling you up and say, yeah, I, I, you know, I have a website. I talk about the worst of wrestling. I thought of you. Do you yeah. want to talk with us? <laughs> the only guy that ever took me up on it was, God bless his soul, Earthquake John Tenta. Such a nice dude. And he would, he, you know, just the, the nicest guy. You wrote the book, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And he was the, the first person that <clears throat> would do an interview with us. And he was just like, if I can't laugh at myself, you know. You know, everyone should be able to laugh at themselves. And he he was uh, so far ahead of his time uh, with that. And it was really, really nice. As far as when we did Death of WCW, <clears throat> a lot of times those people were under contract with uh, WWE or they were either under contract with WWE. So they didn't, you know, they're not going to put their name in a, in a non-sanctioned book. The other thing is, or they they were what I call the Dennis Stamps of the world. Uh, you know, you've seen uh, uh, Beyond the Mat, right? I'm not booked. Sorry, yeah, Terry, I'm, not I'm not booked, booked. right? But <laughs> I, I'm I might be booked. They they were all waiting for that call from Vince, and I think a lot of them were just afraid. You know, if I'd say something in this book, even if it's something, you know, whatever, even if it's something negative about. WCW and Vince should like that. I think they were still really, really scared because there was still that window of opportunity. You know, I might get that call. I might get that call. I may be the guy that's going to face Triple H this year at WrestleMania. People thought that, and, you know, of course they weren't, but, you know, I can also understand, you know, one of the things I never, ever uh, want to say negative about anybody in professional wrestling, and it's been this way since day one at WrestleCrop. <clears throat> is at the end of the day, these are guys trying to put and women trying to put you know food on the table, trying to put a roof over their uh, over their uh, over their heads, trying to provide for their families. And so our thing was always, we never want to say anything negative about those the wrestlers because generally this isn't what they had uh, signed up. Like if you went to John Tenta, he'd never said, you know what I want to do? I want to be the the shark, you know. Yeah, it was just like no, it was something I did because it was something that someone told me to do, and I think it's the same thing there. You know, you you have to be able to provide for your family. So if it's something that uh, could jeopardize that, you don't want to do that, and I completely understand why. It's interesting, like uh, Fred Ottman now, years later, is like okay with it. You know, they made the Shockmaster figure it in the box. It's actually upside down and stuff. So it's funny that the guys now, it seems like they get it more like, oh, I can make some money, you know, with the jokey stuff. And I can, oh, I can, uh, yep. you know, sign this figure. So I feel like nowadays it's a lot better. But back then, you're right. It was a little bit more like, oh, you're making fun of me. You're putting me down. They were not into it. We tried for years to get uh, Fred Ottman on Russell Crap Radio. We could never get him. Even when we had Quake on, we'd have Quake on like several times. Quake always said, oh, Fred's a great guy. You know, I, I for sure he should be on the show with you. You guys, you guys are awesome. You know, we, we, he would have a really, really good time. And, and he just wouldn't do it. And then, like you said, after a few years, uh, the switch flipped and Fred Ottman, we had him on the show one time and he was absolutely hysterical he's, he's great, just yeah. awesome guy he's so funny and he's so you know realizes okay i tripped but you know that's okay it, it, it to this day okay let's say he had come out and that had gone successfully okay he's in a mm -hmm. shot he's in a stormtrooper helmet covered in <laughs> glitter he came out he busted through the wall he's there with davy boy and sting okay would anybody talk about that today if he had not if he had not tripped and the answer not a, is not probably not yeah you nope. know you know it, it would probably go down with you know um you know just something else that would be you know johnny b bad's uh ghetto blast or the 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 uh, bad blaster gun uh thing that he had or or max pain or 
whatever, you know, something that was just kind of a, a forgotten thing. And he made it famous by things not going quite right. And then live on an in infamy. I mean, man, those figures were rare and he was telling me how much money they were worth and stuff. So it's like, wow, imagine if you didn't do that. I doubt they probably make that figure and make it collectible and rare and everything else. So it's pretty cool. Like even if it's a mistake or something silly that it could kind of turn out that way. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it, that's kind of a case in, in life too. I try and tell my, my son this all the time, you know, <clears throat> you're going to have things in life that go not the way they're supposed to go. Things that are going to go bad, you're going to be really upset or you're going to be embarrassed or whatever, as long as it's not causing anyone real problems and it doesn't cause any real tragedies or anything, it's always going to be something that you're going to be able to look back in the years to come and go, you know what, that happened and now I can laugh about it because yep. it's something I'll remember. Again, it's, it's, it's no different than what we're saying about you know, uh, Fred Ottman there. I mean, it's something he will be able to tell and folks will be able to <clears throat> laugh about, uh, for years and years and years. And again, it's, it's just something in life. Things aren't going to go your way. Um, you know, I, I remember one time, like I almost, this was crazy. I was, I was in the Netherlands and I had never been in the Netherlands before. I didn't speak Dutch. It, not, a, not a prayer. And I was in this taxi cab and this crazy taxi cab driver was uh, going the wrong direction. And I was like, no, my hotel's over there. You know, it was crazy. We almost got hit and everything. But still to this day, I always remember that night. I was like, that was so crazy. And if we, if she had just dropped me off at the hotel, I never remembered it. Right. Wouldn't, have, wouldn't yeah. have had a memory of it at all, but because it was wrong and because it was memorable and Honestly, now they really think about it because she was playing, uh, she had a Tom Petty mixtape in, in the car <laughs> and she was playing, uh, she was playing last, last dance with Mary Jane. And it was like, you know, she grew up in an Indiana town. I was like, man, that's Indiana town. This is small world. And I'll always remember that same thing with same thing with any of these wrestle crap characters. They're things you're going to remember in, and that's, what's awesome about it things that you'll remember and you'll laugh about. Yep. Who's the ultimate like wrestle crab? Is it Shockmaster? Like, is that the ultimate or gobbledygooker? Like what's the, Oh, when you think of wrestle crab, what's like the ultimate headline? For I wrestle mean, crab? the, the, the gobbledygooker is what we, we call our award, you know, the year end award mm -hmm. <clears throat> as far as, um, you know, a lot of people say, what, what is the ultimate? So I always look at that, especially because, you know, whenever he came out of the egg and they were in complete, this is, you know, the announcers were like, oh, man, people love it. You know, and then you see the kids booing and everything else, <laughs> spitting on the guy. And uh, you would see all that. Uh, so the gobbledygooker is the one that I always think of. Uh, my, uh, you know, the guy that helps me uh, do the site and Russell Crub Radio, Blade Braxton, he would always look at the black scorpion, you know, because uh, you have this terrible magician act. Uh, and that was, that was, uh, you know, uh, insane too. <clears throat> and then the one we always said was the absolute worst gimmick, the number one worst gimmick of all time that actually did do damage, uh, would have been the red rooster. Cause it, it essentially killed Terry Taylor's career. He'd never go out again. You know, people would just chant, you know, even if he was just a road agent for TNA or something, people would still chant rooster rooster at him. It was like, Oh my gosh, that's awful. <laughs> so bad. Yeah, what I'm trying to always re like remember back is was it just because McMahon thought he was too cocky he was gonna make him the Red Rooster? Was that like the gist of like the joke behind it? I don't know. I I don't know that anybody has ever given me a real answer as to why that was. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, it was always something that you know, just from day one, you kind of sat there and said, "Man, you know, this is this is not gonna work at all." And, and Bobby Heenan, God bless it, God bless him, just. Bobby Heenan was my hero, always was, always will be. And I got to meet him and talk to him about it. And he was just like, that was just the, that was just the worst idea ever. And we all knew going in, this is not going to work. And they tried to do the best they could with it, but they, they all knew, they all knew. Yeah, that was so bad. Then they turned him baby face and he's shooting with yeah. Brooklyn brawler and Heenan's in the middle again. Uh, just, it, it didn't work uh, for me anyway. I was just like, man, that was 
So some speak, especially looking back, I mean, he was quite a wrestler, quite a worker. I yeah. mean, he and he in the mid south, he was great. I mean, it's just like, man, what the hell was Vince thinking on that one? Yeah, yeah, it was also <clears throat> it was also something I, I just look at it and it's like, man, if Bobby Heenan can't make it work, <laughs> you're yeah. in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're screwed. Yeah, you're in a main event of Survivor Series '88. Nope, it's, not, it's still not working. Like nothing is clicking. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it, it was not good at all. But, but as far as like wrestle crap in, in general, like when you think about wrestle crap, like through the years, does Royal Rumble 2005 like stick out when Vince breaks his uh, his two knees or whatever the hell, uh, tears his two quads? Like the yeah, stuff like tore, that just keep quads and yeah, it's like stuff like that just pop in your head. Like, okay, that's hilarious. Another wrestle crap moment, like stuff like that as the years go by. Uh, you know, no, it's more, uh, to me, it's more, you know, just those memorable moments or those, those characters where you're like, who thought this was a good idea? Hmm. Who came up with this idea of projecting maggots onto a wrestling mat? Thought, you know what? People are really going to enjoy that. Hmm. You know, that's really what I look for is, is more the, the stuff that's just so far out there and so far out of left field, you know, that, that, that people just, you know, you, you kind of question how on earth did this ever, how on the earth did anyone think this was, this was a good idea. So th that's more along the lines of what I look for. Mantar, you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Mantar. That was, that was another uh, classic, you know, guy coming out with a, whenever you have an outfit, and your apparatus is so large you can't really get in the ring with it. Oh, that's that sign. may be, yeah. you know, that may be. Although now that I come to think of it, I was about the time Big Van Vader would come to the ring with his big smoke helmet. So maybe that was their answer to Big Van Vader. Yes, this man yes. Part. Although Vader would always put it down, right, and make it know, smoke and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah awesome. Interesting. Interesting yeah. thought. Yeah, I don't think it quite worked though for uh, Mantar. Worked for no, Vader. No, Ma for Mantar was no Vader. That I can tell you. So, did Wrestle Crap spawn the Death of WCW book, or was that there and Alvarez kind of came to you with the idea? Like, it almost seems like Wrestle Crap that kind of uh, aura around it almost created the Death of WCW book. Uh, what happened is <clears throat> I had written the Wrestle Crap book. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was funny because that book almost didn't come to pass. Uh, I had talked to, I, I mean, I had started the site and, you know, it had gotten some popularity, whatever. Uh, and, uh, someone had written into the mailbag at the time cause you didn't have like forums or, and that's how old it was. You didn't have, you sure didn't have social media forums were, were very few and f far between as well. <clears throat> and uh, someone had written into the mailbag and said, would you ever consider writing a book? And I was like, yeah, I'm sure. You know, my degree is actually, you know, break kayfabe. My degree is actually in, in broadcast journalism. <clears throat> so yeah, I probably could write a book. It would probably be kind of an interesting challenge uh, just to see if I could do it. And so I said, but I have no idea who I would talk to. And somebody said, you need to talk with ECW Press up in Canada. And I said, Okay. So I got a hold of ECW Press, and they said, "Okay, well, if you're really serious about writing this book, you need to provide a, you know, I can't even remember what all, a table of contents, a sample chapter, you know, who the book would be targeted to." Um, and so I sent all that stuff to them, and they got it, and they're like, "Yeah, I, they think this, this could be really, really good. It's 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 really funny, uh, you know. Obviously, you, you have uh, you know an audience. I, I they we think this would really, really work." And so we'll get back to you in a week with a contract. So a week goes by, no contract. Two weeks go by, no contract. Two months go by, no contract. And I'm just like, oh, you know, it was a neat idea, you know, but that's never going to happen. Six months go by, and they actually uh, said, we're ready to do the rest of the crap, or the, we're ready to do your book. And I said, great. And, you know, I was like, hey, this is, you know, this is awesome. And they said, we just have one condition. It will not be called wrestle crap, and I am a, a generally a, a really you know laid back, calm kind of guy, uh, and I'll never forget. I just said, "What on earth are you talking about?" And they said, "No, we can't call it wrestle crap." I mean, they they may not carry it at bookstores with the word crap in the title, and I said, 
And I, I just got really mad. And I said, if you're not going to call it Russell crap, I'm not going to write the book for you. And I just hung up the phone and I immediately went to my wife and I said, I just completely screwed up and I lost the book contract because I wouldn't change the title. Yeah. 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 But then, uh, two weeks later they came back and they said, okay, you know, we'll do it. Uh, we'll, we'll call it Russell crap. We'll roll the dice. Uh, it sold better for them than what they ever imagined. Cause I think there were people in that office that thought this is going to sell like 20 copies. Uh, and it, it sold, it sold a pretty good amount for them. So they said, we'd really like you to do a sequel. I mean, it was, it was good enough that they came back and said, we want you to write another book. And I said, okay. And so I was debating what to do for the second book. Cause I didn't want to write another wrestling rap book. That was, it was too soon. And I wasn't quite sure what to do. And <clears throat> I came up with three ideas. One was going to be uh, toy crap, which would have been the worst toys that we had as children. Mm -hmm. So kind of a like pop that. culture book. And I was going to do that. I, I, was, I dreamed of doing it with a, a guy named Matt that works uh, for a site called Dinosaur Dracula. It's still kind of on my wish list one day. And I said, but the other two were wrestling books. And it was either the death of ECW or the death of WCW. And I kept bouncing around, you know, what, what I would want to do. And it came to me again, I want to make people laugh and the death of ECW would have just been too depressing because you had people that really, I mean, people that were taking no pay trying to make this company work. Yep. So I was like, I'm going to do death of WCW, but I said, there's no way I can do, I, I don't know enough. Uh, you know, I can, I can, you know, I can be, I can write it in a comedy way. But I want to have a lot more in depth. Uh, and I was a subscriber to Figure Four Weekly. And so I reached out to Brian. I said, you know, I'm Artie Reynolds, you know, WrestleCrap.com. You know, I wrote this WrestleCrap book. I'd really like to write Death of WCW, but I need a co author. Would you consider doing it with me? And he was on board. <clears throat> and that was a great blessing. Um, because, uh, I mean, Brian, uh, we both poured our heart and soul into that book. Uh, both both versions you know we did the the original in uh, 2004 or whatever and then we did another one 10 years later uh we both just poured our heart and soul into that book uh and uh you know out of that <clears throat> uh it was it was a great blessing um and uh, it's even better now because you know now i just view brian is is a, is a really good friend um you know I, I, I just love his his family and his his his, his oldest daughter is just like the cutest thing ever. I'll never forget, you know, meeting her and I send her, you know, Christmas gifts or whatever, just because I love her so much. And, and of course his grandma, uh, you know, who's on his, uh, podcast as well. I just, I love her to death too. It's kind of like, I just, um, you know, it was another friend and that's what I always say about wrestle crap is, you know, I started it. Um, I started it never to try and, and gain followers or get views or anything. I, to be honest, I've never even looked at not once have I ever looked at, uh, you know, number of page views or uh, Google analytics or any of that stuff. I've never looked at that. I just always wanted it to be something that, uh, you know, in the year 2000 that my, I had a lot of friends, you know, that we would do wrestling shows or whatever. And, I just always wanted something that my friends could go and they could laugh at. And the cool thing about wrestle crap is, um, I still have those friends, you know, that they go and laugh at it, but I wound up with a lot more friends, uh, you know, and it, 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 it could be people that have, you know, read it since day one, or it can be, you know, Brian Alvarez, who I didn't, I had never, you know, done anything with if it weren't for wrestle crap. It, you know, Blade Braxton, one of my best friends in the whole world. I had never met him without that. Uh, or even like Vince Russo, you know, I, I had never talked to him. I had never talked to Bobby Heenan or any of these people. And it's I, it's why, you know, I consider it a great blessing. And it's the coolest thing about Russell Crap is I got to meet all these cool people and, you know, be on, uh, you know, be on a, be interviewed uh, for shows like this. It's incredibly cool. You know, it's, it's just a blessing. 
do you and Brian get a lot of heat for death of WCW at all? Or is it mostly positive? Because obviously you've won two awards from the, you know, the yeah. Meltzer awards. Mm. I know that it caused a lot of heat uh, over, over this past year because ADW yeah. won all the awards and that whole yeah. thing. But you guys won the book awards uh, twice, mm-hmm. uh, 2005 yep. and 14, I believe it was. Yep. Um, but do you guys get a lot of heat or, or is it mostly positive? Uh, it's mostly positive. The other thing I have, I have learned over the years is you're, you can please all of the people none of the time. And, yep. and you're going to have people that, uh, don't like what you have to say. Uh, I remember one of the very first, uh, reviews of the first Russell Crab book was, uh, was with slam wrestling. And it just said, Russell crap is full of crap. That was the headline <laughs> and it wasn't a positive review at all. Uh, but I thought, you know what, that guy, he has a right to his opinion. You know, it's the same thing with with anybody. So if anybody wants to say something negative, you know, <clears throat> I never take it to heart. I'm just like, oh, okay, you know, you, you, you disagree with that. You know, it's kind of like when people say, I almost wore an AEW shirt on for this show tonight. But I knew if I did that, people would continue to say, well, you know, Artie and Brian, they're just on AEW's payroll. Yes. And it's like, man, I really, I'm, I must not have been a very ne- good negotiator because I've not gotten up a single penny from them. I should have done, I should have done a better deal. So people yes. can, people can say negative things and they're, they're more than welcome to everybody's entitled to their opinion. You know, we stand by what we said. And, and the big thing is that there are parts of that book, even today, I will go back if I'm having a bad day and I'll read parts of that book just to make me laugh. Because it makes me laugh, and that's what I always wanted to do. Entertaining for sure. What do you think? It like what was the like the leading downfall? Or what, like when do you think it really took a turn? You think it was ninety nine was was the downturn for WCW? I think when they 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 had no follow up, they had this incredible story with the NWO. I mean, I mean that was great stuff, and people go, "Well, Bischoff stole that from New Japan or whatever." Okay, who cares? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where he got it. Doesn't matter if he stole it or anything else. He took it and he revolutionized the business. <clears throat> he put together something that had everyone talking. Everyone wanted to see what's the NWO going to do. Well, who's going to be the third man? Oh my gosh, Hulk Hogan. He's a bad guy now. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. You know, uh, I got to see what's going to happen next week. But the problem is <clears throat> there was never a resolution to that. And you have this incredible, just imagine, just imagine, imagine if there was a, uh, you know, the Marvel films, okay, with Thanos. Imagine if they just kept doing 20 more films where Thanos never got his comeuppance. I mean, eventually everybody would be like, is 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 this going anywhere? Is this always going to be exactly the same? And I think that was that was the start of it. You know, they got they had another chance with Goldberg, but they didn't know what to do with him either. I remember again talking about Bobby Heenan. Heenan, Heenan just told me he was, they had him. He was huge, and whenever we saw, yeah, we're going to beat him. We we're like, why? You didn't beat Hulk Hogan back in the day. Whenever he was, you know drawing all these sellouts and everything. Why on earth would you do that? Keep Goldberg strong until people don't want to see him strong anymore. And again, they just, they just didn't know what they had. They didn't know what they had. It's one of those things where, man, like you wish you can go back and change things. I was like the biggest WCW fan. So a lot of things I wish, you know, could have been changed. or could have been different. Just interesting to note that you were a broadcast journalist like your hero Bobby Heenan was a broadcast journalist. I keep Absolutely. About that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. He uh, he hit the nail on the head. I don't know if Goldberg should have lost. Oddly enough, though, when he did lose that pop that night at Starcade, I don't know if you remember, it was a huge pop. It was crazy. Mm-hmm. But you think about it, it's like, okay, that was good for that one night. Where do you go from here? He right. probably shouldn't have lost because that that's when they started to really lose momentum. Then they, you know, then you throw another mistake on there. They mentioned Mick Foley winning the title. 800,000 oh, yeah. people slitch over. So it was like little by little. Even Starcade yeah. 97, Sting should have squashed Hogan. Oh, yeah. Boom. Absolutely. I mean, and a lot of people point to that. And I think that is a, <clears throat> I think that, you know, that's kind of a, a, a microcosm uh, of what happened is again, you had somebody that this should have just, 
It should have, you know, just gone, you know, this should have been the big culmination. Sting comes out and he, and, you know, he destroys Hogan and everybody's happy. Everybody would have been so happy. They've been high-fiving and everything else. When people left that night, they were more kind of confused. <clears throat> and that is not, you know, that was their biggest pay-per-view, you know, ever they had done. And you, you sometimes you just overthink things. And I think they, they did there. Big time. And it's funny too, because me and my buddies, we you know taped it on VHS back then. Oh, we yeah. like we would go back at the show because we we're so confused. We wanted like I think Sting's shoulder was up. Like we were like trying to figure out you know, right. we're like 17. I think we we're 17 at that point. Or have we? What was it? So Starky 97. No, we we're 15 at that point. So right. it's like, oh, he had a shoulder. Oh, like, so we're so confused as a fan. We're clueless. We're like, what happened? Like that was so that was so bad. <laughs> yeah, and it was something you're trying to you're trying to write your own storyline so it made sense for you. You yeah, never want to yeah. have that. You never want to have yeah. that. Yep. So as we hit the a wind down, we head towards the finish here. Who is like, as far as you know, wrestle crap, the very worst of wrestling. What about the very best of wrestling? Who like who's your favorite? Who's some guys that you could look back? You're like, okay, this is why I love the business. These guys are the best. Yeah, Bobby Heenan. I mean, it's not even. I mean, it's not even a contest. I know it wasn't when he was wrestling, but. <clears throat> When I the the first time I ever watched wrestling, it would have been in the right past the rock and wrestling connection. And I had a buddy of mine who I said, Hey, you gonna come over? You know, we got all we did was play video games. It's all I did. And I said, You gotta come over tonight, let's play some video games. He's like, Can't do it, I'm gonna watch wrestling tonight. So like, wrestling, what are you talking about? And so uh, I watched primetime wrestling. And one of the first matches I ever saw was a British Bulldogs match. And Dynamite Kid and David Boy, too, back then. But especially Dynamite Kid was so awesome. And I was like, this is really, you know, this is really interesting. This is kind of interesting. I'm going to watch it, you know, again in, in, you know, next week or whatever. And what I saw that hooked me was not, that's what, got me to watch was the British Bulldog. So I always have a soft spot in my, in my heart for them. Uh, but, uh, it was seeing Bobby Heenan and gorilla monsoon still to this day. It, and I had mentioned if I'm having a bad day, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I will just go back and I will watch Heenan and monsoon primetime wrestling is just still my all time favorite thing. All time favorite thing. Now, as far as like, you know, in ring or whatever. There's been so many greats over the years. I was always a huge Bret Hart fan. I loved Austin. Uh, you know, Rock was was fantastic. And now, <clears throat> you know, Wednesday nights. Uh, I'm not on the payroll. Let me make this abundantly clear. But I I love watching AEW. I love I love seeing these these new uh, you know uh, people that I had never really seen. Like I'd never seen you know the young bucks in any kind of capacity and, and hangman page and Omega and that man, that Omega page um, bucks match from, you know, a couple years or whenever that was a year, last year. Right. Yep. That was just incredible. And, you know, uh, bucks FTR because again, British Bulldogs. Right. So I love tag team wrestling. And so I love seeing, um, I love seeing awesome tag team wrestling and, you know, you can, uh, decry, <clears throat> you know, uh, the lack of psychology or whatever you want uh, in Young Bucks matches. I don't really care. I I just enjoy watching those matches, and I think I think they're awesome. Love watching them. Anytime anytime the Bucks come out, you know, <clears throat> I just I just love watching them. So I'm sure I lost a lot of I uh, lost a lot <laughs> of credibility with a yeah. lot of people, but yep. th but that's okay. Hate You're hated now. You can't believe uh, you said that. Oh my god. That's all right. People say uh, wrestle crap is full of crap again. It's okay. What comes around, you know, it all comes back around. I feel like uh, AEW, it's just something different. WWE, it's like, yes. you know exactly where you're going to get. AEW, is sometimes it's like, okay, you, you know, you have like a, almost like a sense of optimism. WWE is like, okay, here we go. Same old, same old. Maybe not with Roman Reigns so much. It's a little bit different. I kind of like that character, but like Raw every week, it's like, all right, here we go again. What's going it's on also week? something that <clears throat> it's also something, and I, and I have thought a lot about this, 
And I almost think I like AEW more as... I, I think I like it more as just... And this isn't a knock against them. There's a lot of things in AEW that are great. Bucks, you know, Moxley, Omega. That Omega act with Don Callis is tremendous. Um, but it's also something... they It feels like someone you want to see succeed... You know what I mean? Yep. It's like this grassroots movement, and I I'll never forget that at you know at uh, the first Starcast and the second Starcast, which was uh, Double or Nothing out in Vegas. <clears throat> and I was sitting there, and I was sitting there with uh, who was I there with? Uh, uh I, I was there with the with the guy from uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, not after. Uh, I want to say it was a Stu Sachs. Stu Sachs. Conrad got me tickets for Double or Nothing. I was sitting right next to Stu Sachs, and Stu Sachs, great guy. And we're like watching this, and these people. It's like a grassroots movement where people have been so beaten down by WWE, they want so badly to see somebody else succeed. They want so badly to have an alternative. So it's this passion, this passionate group. And sometimes that's not the best thing either. Sometimes people are, are a little crazy then. But with this, there was this passionate group, and, and it's this grassroots movement that you're like, I want to be part of this. I want to see this succeed because these people seem happy. I mean, it was funny because I had listened to this. Um, uh, uh, you know, you had mentioned the Observer Awards. And Dave had Tony Khan on, okay? And Tony Khan just sounded like he was so happy. And I thought, when was the last time we ever saw, you know, Vince McMahon happy? When was the last time we saw Triple H happy? When was the last time we saw, you know, Stephanie happy? When was the last time we saw anyone in WWE truly happy? Like they're on you know, some kind of call or something. And you see these people that are happy. And, and I it hit me. The last person I saw that was happy, that seemed really happy to be out there with the fans and everything, her name was Becky Lynch. And she got super popular. Why? I think a lot of it was people were like, I want, I want that. That woman seems happy. She she seems happy to be out there. She seems like she's really enjoying life. And isn't that what we should all do? And isn't that what we should all be striving for. So whenever I heard that interview with Tony Khan, he just sounded like he was so happy. And can't we all be happy? I would love to see Vince just, you know, go on a conference call and talk about how, oh, man, things are great, you know, and smiling and laughing. and hmm. it, but, but you don't ever see that. You don't see that. And I think it just puts a dark cloud over WWE. And I, you know, they always like to say we want to put smiles on people's faces. You know, maybe put smiles on your own faces first. True. Very, very true. Uh, Tony Khan, AEW, swept the awards, like I mentioned. So, yeah, yeah he, he's living it up right now. He's loving life. I think even, even if he wasn't, I don't, even if they hadn't, even if they, they, he, I don't think he would still be, you know, um, super negative. You know, I, 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 it just seems, and again, that could just be they have sold a bill of goods to old R.D. Reynolds and he bought it, you know, but I just seem like these, it feels to me like these are these are people you want to see succeed, you know, they seem like they're decent people and <clears throat> they want to present something that people are going to enjoy watching. For sure. Now, as far as yourself and what you got going on and all your plugs and stuff, or is it, well, is it WrestleCrap.com? Give us all the, uh, the plugs and everything you got yep. going on. Uh, WrestleCrap.com, always the best place to go. Uh, I'm on Facebook, WrestleCrapRD, uh, and WrestleCrap, and then uh, Twitter's the same thing, uh, uh, WrestleCrapRD. Uh, I'm I'm mostly, as you can tell, I'm an older uh, an older gentleman. It's okay. I, I've come to accept that I'm in no demographic that anyone ever caters to now. Uh, so I'm mostly on on old person uh, social media, which is Facebook. So. 
What about the books? Where can everybody get the books? Uh, go to Amazon or go to WrestleCrap.com. You can link out to Amazon and, and get them there. Uh, we have uh, WrestleCrap, the WrestleCrap, uh, excuse me, WrestleCrap, Death of WCW, uh, and then also the WrestleCrap Book of Lists, which was a which was a fun project I got to work on years ago. Is uh, Death of WCW still your favorite book? Oh man, that's like asking which of favorite your kid, favorite right? your favorite kids. <laughs> I, I can't I can't do that. I can't do that. Hey, I I am a big fan of Death of WCW. I like it. I like Thank Nitro you. too, but Death yep. of WCW though, that's uh I don't know. Like you said, it's much more uh, enter- entertaining. Uh, mm. Nit- yeah. Nitro is definitely more analytical, but uh, I am a big fan of Death of WCW. Thank Even you. if Bischoff doesn't like it because he hasn't read it, uh, <laughs> I'm still a fan. That's okay. One day, my, one day, uh, maybe I'll send him the audio book and he can at least listen to it. Yeah, there you go. Good idea. Yeah. Yep. RJ, thank you uh, for all the time. I really appreciate it. Great Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Awesome. Anytime you need anything else, just let me know. <laughs>